You may be seated. I don't know about you. But I do believe that through our worship and our adoration that the scepter of the king has been pointed towards us and we can come freely before the throne of grace and ask whatever it is that we have need of today. There's an old mythological story of about a bird called the phoenix. And I won't go into the whole story because that could take me quite a while. But suffice it to say that it wanted to live forever. And it didn't know what to do and it got tired after it was getting old and it did some things and the sun burned it up and consumed it. And out of those ashes rose the phoenix. There's a similar parallel in the word of God. And in John chapter 11, verse 43 and 44, it says, And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus! Come forth. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound with a napkin. And Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. What does that have to do with what we're talking about? Well, in those days when they wrapped with grave clothes, they wrapped him with various pieces of linen and wrapped the body up. And sometimes in our walk with God, we allow those grave clothes, those strips of cloth to bound us one strip at a time until we are just sitting there in the tomb, not able to move. For whatever reason, whatever has happened in our lives, we've bitterness and hurts and, and all manner of things which have gripped us and wrapped us up in those grave clothes one strand at a time. Sometimes we have faith for miracles but sometimes we don't have faith for the God that we just worship to fix us. And we don't think that we can offer anything to the kingdom of God. We're so bound up by those grave cloths. My friends, all of us are of inestimable value to our king. Every one of us that's in here today, whether you have a walk with God or whether you do not have a walk with God as of yet, you are of great value to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you may have come in here all wrapped up by sin and shame and whatever else has have you bound. But God is asking you to come forth. Lazarus, come forth. And he's asking the church to lose you. He's asking the people of God to step in and take those great clothes off. Let the phoenix in us rise again. only knew just how important you are to the kingdom of God. He actually said that one soul, one soul is more valuable than the whole world. My goodness. And he didn't say that that soul was saved. He said it doesn't matter whether you're saved or lost, you're still valuable to him. Amen. Would you mind standing with me just for a moment as we go to the Word of God? I welcome all you visitors. Enjoy. 
meeting you before church in the hospitality suite. If you're here today as a visitor and you didn't make it to the hospitality suite, I'd like to invite you to stop in next service and enjoy some conversation, some donuts. My wife won't buy donuts at home, so it's the only place I get to eat donuts. My body is going through withdrawals on trans fats. I need some more. <laughs> but it's always a pleasure to, to greet all of you visitors. It's, a, it's an honor to have you with us today. John chapter 6, verse 15. While you're turning to John 6, 15, let me just reiterate a victory report. We had prayer yesterday. If you weren't here, you really missed it. What a glorious move. Manifestation of the presence of God. And we had a first-time visitor, Penny, a co-worker of Sister Goff. And towards the end of the prayer, the Holy Ghost moved on her. and She began speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Of course, I ran back there and stopped her. I told her that has to, that's not Wednesday or Sunday. You have to come back tomorrow on Sunday to receive. You know, John got the Holy Ghost on, I think it was a Thursday afternoon in the baptismal tank. Right, John? That wasn't a Wednesday or Sunday. I, I don't know what's going on around here, but these people just don't know. They're supposed to wait and do everything traditionally. And, they're getting baptized and receiving the Holy Ghost. Next thing you know, people are going to get up out of wheelchairs. And, and, and on Monday and Tuesday and Friday, Jesus just did it every day. And he wants us to be like him. So let's just do it every day, every day. John chapter 6, verse 15 when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, that was right after he fed the 5,000. They were like, you know, we, we'd like you to stick around for a little while. We didn't even have to work for this food. Why don't you lead us and continue? Give us some more food tomorrow. It says he departed again to a mountain himself alone. In one of the other gospels regarding the same story, it says he... he stowed away into a mountain to pray. Verse 16, and when even was, co was now come, that means night was come. Commentators say it was the second evening. His disciples went down unto the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty or 30 furlongs, about three and a half miles. They see Jesus walking on the sea, drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But he saith unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. It says that Jesus was drawing nigh to them, and they were afraid. But he said unto them, It is I, be not afraid. In one of the other Gospels, that's when Peter said, If it's really you, ask me to come out on the water. And Jesus said, Come on out. All these stories are tied together, written from a different perspective, a different personality, but it's all about the same thing. But I want to preach on the subject, Seeing in Fear knowing in faith seeing in fear but knowing in faith we can see Jesus and be afraid in fact in the book of Revelation it talks about the end time it says people are actually hiding in caves praying that mountains would fall on them rather than to see him face to face seeing in fear but knowing in faith would you mind praying with me just for a moment Lord it is a fearful thing to fall into your hands 
it can be a fearful thing to experience your presence for the first time. It can be a fearful thing, Lord, to come into your presence, to have you approach us. But Lord, let it not be a fearful thing, but a peaceful thing. Peter said, if it's really you, then I want to come closer. Lord, fear goes away when acknowledgement of who you are comes into our hearts and our spirits. God, help us to understand who you are today, that we would be able to approach you and you can approach us not in fear, but in faith. I pray that you would touch every one of us and help us to draw you near today. Help us to erase every line of comfort today and say, God, I may not be comfortable with this. I may not understand this, but I welcome you. I welcome you. I'll come out to get you, Lord, and together we'll get in the ship. I pray for that today, Lord. Would you touch us and talk to us today? In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, turn to someone that you didn't come here with and say, I'm going to know him in faith. Seeing in fear. I remember the first time I walked into a church like this. I was seeing in fear. <laughs> My brother picked me up and brought me there. So I couldn't run. I couldn't get away. I would have found some excuse to go out to my car. You know, said I forgot my brain out there or something. I would have come up with something just to get out of that place. But now it's a lot different when Jesus shows up. Now when he shows up, faith begins to soar. Peace begins to come over my soul when Jesus shows up. No longer fearful, but faith comes into my life. Jesus was able to miraculously overcome every obstacle that frustrated the disciples at this point. When I look at <clears throat> the story, I'm, I'm going to bounce around a little bit. I'm just going to kind of talk about this story today, try to, be, uh, try to be applicable to our lives where we are. But when we look at where they are, they, Jesus literally told them after this whole feeding the 5,000, breaking the loaves and the fishes, etc., and he told the disciples, he said, go across to the other side, and they did, and he departed from them. He split from them and went up into the mountain to pray. And it says that they rode in one of the stories, in one of the uh, Gospels, it says that they toiled hard. And, 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 and we look at what was going on, and they had gone three and a half miles, and three and a half miles they were rowing, and every commentator says it was approximately eight to nine hours. They were rowing hard for eight to nine hours and only made it three and a half miles, approximately. According to my calculations, that's one-third mile per hour. We walk, what, three or four miles an hour? So they were all rowing at one-third mile per hour. They should have stopped and fished or something, done something productive instead of just rowing and have you ever felt like in your walk with God that you were rowing and not getting anywhere? Have you felt that you were exerting so much pressure, so much, so much energy trying to get something done, and yet you never could make progress? This is what Jesus is trying to tell us today. He's trying to say there are things that we are instructed of God to do, and yet when we don't make progress, we turn around and run or change direction. God says, keep rowing. But I've only gone three and a half miles. Keep rowing. I told you to do it. You're in my will. Keep rowing. I'm watching every step of the way. Jesus was there to rescue them, not from fear, but from futility. The word toiling in Mark chapter 6 regarding the same story, when I looked that up, it meant torture and pain. Have you ever exerted so much energy? You were like, my muscles are cramping up, and this is torture. I feel pain doing this. 
you can go out and get the morning paper and feel pain because of all the exertion of energy. I've never used those muscles before. But they were doing everything that they could for approximately nine hours. Nine hours pulling on that on those row uh, on those oars against the storm. Jesus wants us to work hard. We could say, maybe I'm just not supposed to do anything. Maybe I'm just supposed to sit here on the shore and watch the storm pass. Yet Jesus sent them out in a storm. Just because you're in a storm today doesn't mean Jesus doesn't want you there. Well, if it's the will of God, everything will be smooth. How many stories would you like me to tell you about the word of God that disregard that? There are also people that say, anytime there is opposition, that must be the will of God because the devil's trying to stop me. You can justify whatever you want. All I'm telling you is Jesus sent them out in that boat and they were having some trouble. Just because we're in the will of God, don't turn around. Keep rowing, keep pressing. Keep trusting. <laughs> On this occasion, he came to rescue them from futility, not just fear. And they were in this uncomfortable place because Jesus told them to cross the lake. They were having trouble because Jesus told them to go away. Now notice they departed from Jesus. Jesus separated from them. He went up into a mountain to pray, told them to go off. And I'll meet you on the other side. We're going to face trials when we set out to do exactly what Jesus tells us to do. Well, I'm not really enjoying this right now. Just keep rowing. I'm tired and exhausted. Keep rowing. You know, there's part of this story, and you have to put the Gospels together to figure this out. But as they were in frustration... Partial fear. Last time we were in a, in, a, in a storm like this, Jesus was with us. He was asleep in the back, and Peter cries out like only Peter can. Don't you care that we're drowning? And Jesus gets up, peace be still, stops the storm. That's all well and good when Jesus is in your boat, but what if he's not with you? What if he's not there where you can touch him, where you can look at him, where you can hear his voice speak? But please be rest assured that while you're rowing and you're frustrated and you're afraid and you're, you're, you're pressing with everything that you can and you feel like you're in the will of God, there is a Savior that is on top of a mountain who's watching you. He sees everything you're doing. There's a reason why he went up on that mountain, folks. He was watching what they were doing. He saw the fact that the storm came. He saw the fact that they were rowing hard. And he waited until they needed him. And he came to their rescue. We should never be deceived into thinking that if we're really right with God, everything's going to be easy. Oh, my goodness. I got a scripture for you. They that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Well, I thought everything was going to be a bed of roses. There's thorns in roses, folks. There's thorns. You lay on a bed of roses, you're going to get poked. Understand me? There's things that come along, and sometimes God pokes us just to see if we're paying attention. Sometimes he allows things to come our way just to make sure we're still putting our faith in him. We still trust him. We're still rowing. I don't know why I'm rowing, but he told me to row. People make fun of you. You sit out there and row and say, you know, you should have put a big Evan root on the back of that thing and pushed yourself across the lake. He's, God said row. I'm rowing, but you're not getting anywhere. Just row and trust in God. When God says do something, I promise you, number one, he's watching. Number two, he's got a plan. And if we'll just stick with the plan, he'll show up when we need him. Oh, I'm talking to somebody today. Somebody's frustrated. Somebody's afraid. Somebody's doubting God. And God says, I'm watching. Oh, God. 
Oh. Mark 6, 46 says he was praying upon a mountain. And in verse 48 it says he saw them toiling and rowing. All the time they were struggling, Jesus was watching. Oh, there's times when I felt like he was busy doing something else. He was busy at a food bank somewhere. He was busy handing out bagels and locks somewhere. I mean, he was, he was definitely not paying attention to my situation. But Pastor Yance always said, he said, when you can't track him, when you can't track him, you trust him. When I can't figure out what he's doing, you just say, Lord, every time, every time I've gotten into trouble, every time my world came crashing in, I, I didn't know where you were. I couldn't find you. It says, feel after him if happily you might find him, for he is not far from every one of you. He's there. You might not be able to feel him, but he said, feel after him. Just reach out. Sometimes we don't know where he is. Sometimes we can't figure out what he's doing, but we just got to say, Lord, you told me to roll. You told me to go to the other side, and I'm in the will of God. He told David, he told David through the prophet that he was going to be the next king. So every time when the king tried to kill him, he didn't take things into his own hands. He just said, well, God told me I was going to be king, so I, just, I guess I just got to wait and do the right thing. Just do the right thing. The Bible says that he did right in all of his, all of his ways. David did. He, he pleased the Lord in all of his ways. He, he just kept doing right things. God tested him and he did right things. Why? Because he trusted God. He meets Goliath and he's like, well, everybody else is afraid of him. Well, I know I'm going to the throne, so I, I'm in the will of God. I'm just going to keep doing right things. Just keep standing up for God. Jesus knew exactly what was going on. And he was monitoring their progress all the way across that lake. He saw them straining at rowing, yet let them work at it for a good long time. Even though they were tired, even though they were straining, even though the stress of their situation was bearing down on their hearts. Where are you, Jesus? Nine hours. He'll be here any minute. Come on, Jesus, now's a good time. Nine hours. We feel like he's forgotten us. We feel like he's too busy doing something else. Yet Jesus still let them row. He still let them exhaust themselves in doing what he asked them to do. How long will we press? Will we stop after one or two or eight or nine Will we stop or will we roll until he shows up? Will we keep pressing forward? Will we keep living for God until he shows up? Will we keep obeying the word of God until he shows up? Will we trust him when we can't track him? Oh, God. Hallelujah. At the perfect point when they needed him, he showed up. The disciples had just seen Jesus turn down an offer to be king. They said, man, you can make all this loaves and fishes. We were, it, they were, they were going to force him. They were going to surround him. The commentators, I read, I read through 14 different commentators. It's like they, they, it's like they were going to gang up on him and say, hail the king. You know, when they did that, it was like, okay, it's over. And everybody's like, yes, all hail the king. May Jesus live forever. <laughs> Little did they know. So they were about to do that, and Jesus slips away. I don't know if he, like, disappeared on them like he did in other instances, slipped through the crowd. I'm thinking, why didn't they grab him? I don't know. He just went into a mountain to pray. The disciples might have thought that this was why he came, to set up his kingdom there. Might have been. Maybe that's why they were following him. I have at least one instance. There's more. I didn't have time to give you all of them, but look at when... Matthew 16, 22, it says, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee. Jesus told them, I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to, be, I'm going to raise again on the third day. And Peter said, Oh, no, you're not. Right. Right. Peter was like, Oh, no, I don't want you following that plan. We have a different plan for you. Uh-oh. 
Notice this. He said, this shall not be unto thee. You're not going to die for my sins. <laughs> what a dummy. What, you know, you're, you're not going to give your innocent blood so that I can be free and live forever. We're so selfish sometimes, foolish. But then Jesus, it says, he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. See the situation? He said, you're trying to follow humanity ways. He said, what I'm about to do is of God. Peter was focused on the flesh, which is what the people were with the loaves and the fishes. They wanted Jesus to be king. They were total focusing on a fleshly kingdom. And Jesus said, I rebuke you, Satan. I didn't come to set up my kingdom here. I came to set up my kingdom in heaven, and I'll meet you there. That's what he did. Have we ever been in the worst of circumstances and have seen the deliverer approach and at first cry out for fear, trembling at his nearness. We can be in such trouble. Our lives falling apart, and all of a sudden the very one who can take care of our problems shows up. The very person that could deliver them from their circumstance showed up, and they were afraid of him. We can do that also. We can be afraid of the unknown. Well, I don't really know what you're doing. I'm, I'm not really understanding what I'm feeling here, so why don't you just back off and let me figure this out. We can also be afraid that Jesus may be up to trying to change the way that we live. I don't like my situation. That's what my, my family did for me. Oh, God. Would you help Bob? He's on drugs. Help him. Deliver him from those addictions. And when God did, called me into the ministry, they were like, oh, no, no. No, we, we just wanted him off drugs. We, we didn't want him all crazy about Jesus stuff. We just, we just don't want him to... See, we can do that with God. Oh, God, help me. And he shows up when he goes, oh, not that much. You scare me. You Pentecostals are scary. You get all worked up about Jesus and you get all kind of crazy. I'm, I'm a fan, folks. I'm a fan. And I'm not talking about the Bears and I'm not talking about the Packers. I'm a fan of Jesus Christ. He's, I'm a fanatic. I'm crazy about him. There is a point that he will show up and you will be afraid. But I'm telling you, if you will get to know him, you can show up in faith. You will not have fear, but you will have faith. Hallelujah. Jesus said in John 6, 20, this amazed me. But he saith unto them, it is I, be not afraid. It is I, be not afraid. Of course, when Peter knew that, he said, can I walk on water like you? But the commentaries said this, and I looked up the word when Jesus said, it is I. It literally is this. Wait for it. Wait for it. I am. <laughs> Jesus, to his disciples, when they were all afraid that he might be a ghost, an apparition, just walking on the water, some spirit of the departed, Jesus said, I am. Don't be afraid. When the disciples heard that, they were like, I am? Wait a minute, I'm a Jew. I know what he's saying. He's saying, God. Every one of the commentators, they were talking about the divinity of Jesus Christ. They were saying, this is the God in him that was speaking because it's the I am of the Old Testament. I'm like, hello, he's not just the I am of the Old Testament. Jesus said, I am he that was, that is, and that it is to come. I am the Almighty. If Jesus comes into your life and your life is a mess and he says, I am, <laughs> it's time to say, I haven't walked on water lately. Let's give it a shot. 
When the I am is standing there and he says, I am, be not afraid. It's time to ask for something. If it's you, what did Peter say? If you're really I am, I want to do what you do. Let me turn that around. Jesus said, because I am, I want you to do what I do. Greater things than these shall you do. Because I'm getting out of here in the flesh and I'm coming back in the spirit. And you're going to do greater things than this. Greater things than the Messiah did. You just watch. I'm going to give you the power to do it. Verse 17 says that darkness came. It says darkness came, but Jesus didn't. Oh, Jesus. I don't like darkness. The Bible says that men love darkness for their deeds are evil. I don't like darkness. I don't like it when darkness comes. I especially don't like it when darkness comes and Jesus isn't there. That's what it says. In the, it says, and it was now dark and Jesus was not come to them. Is it possible to have Jesus in our life and it to be dark? Oh, horrible things have happened to people that are loving God and living for God. Oh, God, when darkness comes, when things come that we can no longer bear, be rest assured that Jesus is on the mountain watching you and praying for you. He wasn't just watching. He wasn't just enjoying your problem. He was looking and he was saying, there's something I'm going to teach them through this and I'm watching and I'm going to make sure that they're okay. I'm going to make sure I'm praying. He was not just watching, folks. It said he went up into that mountain to pray. What was he praying for? He was praying for the disciples, saying, God, let them keep rowing. Make sure they don't give up. Make sure they keep pressing forward and obeying my word because I don't want him to give up. I want him to know when I ask him to do something that I will be there for them. So that for some seven or eight or nine hours, they'd been pulling at the useless oars or sitting there shivering, wet and weary and exhausted in that boat. One time before, they were in a similar, similar storm on the lake, but it was daylight like I said, Jesus was with them, and it does make a difference when you can see him. But this time it was night. Looking up to the vein, or uh, looking up in vain to those eastern green hills. Where is he? We saw him begin walking up a mountain. Where is he? Why did he leave us out here to struggle like this? Where is he hiding? Where is he so far from our help? Mark gives us the insight, he saw them, but they didn't see him. That's a problem sometimes in our lives. First of all, sometimes we don't realize that he sees us in our struggle. Jesus is watching everything you're going through. I'm telling you, he sees it. There's nothing that happens in your life. I'm not talking about whether you're saved or lost. I'm talking about everything. There's nothing that escapes his view right now. But there are times when we don't realize that he sees everything that we're going through. But even more importantly, there are times when we can't see him. Have we ever mistaken the coming master and tremble before him when we ought to be glad? Has there ever been times when Jesus has walked into our life, when he's, a, when he's manifested, he's made his presence known to us, and we trembled, and we were afraid of his presence, and we should be glad? My goodness, they were in a heap of trouble. They were exhausted, afraid, working in futility, afraid of the spirit that they saw, and should have been glad to see him. There are times when we can be afraid to see him. First of all, if we don't understand who he is. Secondly, if maybe we're doing something that we really don't want him to see in the flesh. The Bible says in that same 
portion of Scripture that when Jesus got in the boat, other portions, probably when Peter and Jesus got back in the boat, when Peter got back in and Jesus got in the boat, it says they arrived at their destination immediately. Two things about this. It took them nine hours to row that direction against the wind. Sometimes it takes us a lifetime to row ourselves into the middle of a storm. Addictions, families falling apart, diseases in our bodies. The feeling of darkness hits us. Satan is nipping at our heels. We feel life crashing in, and it took us all of our life to get there. But when Jesus stepped in their boat, they arrived at their destination immediately. What took you a lifetime to get into trouble, Jesus can turn around in a second. If you'll let him get in your boat. Oh, let him get in your boat today. But secondly, life with all of its dreary problems can seem to last forever. But once Jesus gets in your boat, the rest of the journey can seem but a moment. I could tell you this, my life, what a mess before I came to him. But that was 29 years ago. The first 25 seemed forever. But the last 29 have seemed but a moment. And it's not just because I'm getting older, folks. It's because Jesus is in my boat. Jesus is in my boat, and this journey has been with joy. It's been with miracles, signs, and wonders. There is a, an eternal well bubbling up in my soul. I can't wait to see him again. I want to see him again. My life is not dreary. My life is full of joy. Remember from this story, because Jesus did not come to their rescue immediately, that delay does not mean denial. So many times we get into our situation and we make a ruling like a judge and we say, well, I guess he's not going to show up, kind of like Saul did with Samuel. It's time for the evening sacrifice and Samuel's not here. I guess I'll go ahead and disobey the word of God. And they do it by saying the ends justifies the means. Well, I'm going to offer a sacrifice unto God. It's worship, so I'm just going to go ahead and do it. The Word of God says you better not. But Saul just stepped ahead, and he said, I'm going to go ahead and offer it. And once you know, <laughs> seriously, the smoke is still going up. And here comes Samuel. What's going on, bro? He's like, well, I was afraid the enemy is going to come in, and you, you weren't here. Our flesh does that to us all the time. It justifies our foolish mistakes and our foolish justifications. And we, we convince ourselves to do things that we know the Word of God says not to do. And we justify it by saying, well, it's worship. Well, I was just trying to do the right thing. And yet Samuel comes along and he says, what are you doing? Delay. It's because we don't have the patience of delay. God, you sent me into the water. And I know that even if you delay, you'll be there. Because you're the one I'm following. You're the one I'm obeying. And I know you'll show up just in time because I am following your word. There are times when Jesus approaches people and they don't know him. These were the disciples. These weren't just anybody. These were people that just left him nine hours before. Well, I didn't recognize you. You know, there's some people I don't recognize, but it's like the people I graduated with. Wow, you're looking old. <laughs> Man, you know, you don't quite recognize, but this was nine hours, and they didn't recognize him. There are times when Jesus shows up in your life and in my life, and we don't recognize him. Because we're looking for something else. We expected him to be here nine hours ago. When we were tired, we expected things to happen a certain way, in a certain manner, and yet he just didn't show up. 
So when he does show up in his way, in his manner, we don't recognize him. Jesus. Jesus came down into the plain to feed the people. That was when he fed the 5,000. And then he returned to the mountain alone to pray. That's when he sent his disciples across the water. I saw that. I thought, there's something there. He came down. He came down from the mountain to feed the flesh. But he went back up the mountain to pray. What is he trying to tell us? The flesh is a lower place than the spirit. There is a high place. It's called the spiritual realm. And he said, you come down from there to deal with the things of the flesh. And when you do, they're going to want to they're going to want to bow before you. They're going to want to make you king. They're going to want to give you all this pomp and splendor and you say, "No, just trying to help. I'll be back. I'm going back up to pray." But notice the spirit is a higher place. It's harder to get to up the mountain but a definite advantage in battle. They always said who was on the upper, upper side of a hill, who's ever up on the hill. If you're having a sword battle with somebody, if you're up on the hill and they're below you, you have an advantage. Notice Jesus, when he wanted an advantage, when he knew his disciples were going to be in the middle of a storm, he didn't stay on the plain and he didn't go in the valley. He headed up the mountain. Why? Because he wanted an advantage. He wanted the advantage. He wanted to say, this is going to cost me some prayer, but I'm going to get the advantage. So, so many people get themselves into trouble, and they stay in the valley. They stay on the plain. They start dealing with the flesh. Well, I'm smart enough to deal with this. I'm strong enough. i got enough talents. i got enough money to deal with this. And God says, get out of the plain and get up the mountain. Start to climb. It's time to pray. I don't know if you've ever been high up on a mountain, but the view, the, the view is far better from a mountain anyways. You can see what's going on. Another thing about this, Jesus went down to minister to the people, to feed them. He said, these people are tired. They've been here listening to me for all this time, and I don't want them to pass out because of a, a, because of a lack of eating. Public church services must never replace private devotions. We come to church on Wednesday, we come on Sunday, but that should never replace our private devotion. Jesus is saying, you go down to minister to the people, but go back up to the mountain to begin gaining some spiritual advantage over the enemy. It's time to pray, folks. It's time to go up the mountain. Don't worry about the public service. We can only do so much. I'm thankful for the people that have these food banks and, and feed the poor and, 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 and help the homeless, etc. The problem is, is you feed them for a day. It's time to feed them for a lifetime. You can only in the plane feed them for a day. You can only affect their life for a day. But if you head up the mountain, you can affect them for a lifetime. Even though the disciples made little progress, and I'm finishing up. <sighs> Even though they made little progress, they kept rowing. Because Jesus told them to head to Capernaum. When Jesus gives us direction, just keep heading. Just keep going. Water was coming in over the, the waves were coming in over the bow. And they kept bailing it out. Other times, don't you care that we perish? They bailed out water that came in. The church, the boat, the ark needs to constantly keep the waves of the world outside of the church. As we row this church towards heaven, sometimes it's going to feel like we're not making much progress, but just keep rowing. When the worldly waves come crashing over the bow of this ship, we need to keep bailing out the water of the world.
We need to say, not welcome here. This sin is not welcome here. We're going to bail out. Worldliness. I don't want to be like the world. We need to continue because the waves will keep crashing into a church. Pastor Yance told me, he said, if you ever want to be a holiness church, he said, you're never going to have to worry about job security. He said, because the world will always keep crashing in to the church and you have to keep bailing out the water. He said, it'll be something you'll have to work on for the rest of your life. He said, but it'll be worth it because this church is going to heaven. This is not not going to be a worldly church. This will be a holy church without spot or blemish. <sighs> After the incarnation, he remained 30 years in obscurity. After he was born, 30 years, nothing. Talk about a delay. Where are you, Jesus? Lazarus was dying, a friend of his. Yet he stayed away from Bethany till he was dead. He delayed. He lingered on the mountain while his disciples were struggling in the storm. There are times that we feel his distance. Where are you? But there's something Jesus said. It just came to me this morning at about 6 o'clock. Jesus said, I have to go away. You're leaving us? Yeah. Because if I don't go away, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, can't come. What are you saying? Jesus was saying, if you'll put distance from the flesh, I'll bring the power of the Spirit. I didn't read that in a book. He just told me that this morning. Don't get so used to Peter. Oh no, I'm never going to let that happen. You're used to the flesh, Peter. You're so used to him being around. What you really need to do is let go of the flesh. And let him come back in the spirit. How about let's go a little further. Let's take him off the cross. He's not on the cross anymore. We're familiar with that. Let's take him out of the manger. He's not in a manger. Definitely let's take him out of the grave. Because he's not there anymore. He's the one true God sitting on the only throne in heaven. Right? That's who Jesus is. He wanted a change from power around us to power in us. They got so used to Jesus displaying power around them. Where are you, Jesus? I got to go away. For how long? Oh, 10 days. And then I'm going to come back in the spirit in your hearts. I'm going to write the law inside your hearts. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost, which is the Comforter, shall come upon you. Because I'm no longer going to be with you. See, when somebody's with you, that's one thing. But when they're in you, totally different story. Jesus was with them as he walked on the water, and they were afraid of him. But once he's in you, <laughs> no more fear. No more fear when he approaches. Because he's no longer with us, but he's now in us. Notice Colossians 2.12, buried with him in baptism. Would you stand with me? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. His name shall be called Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us. Old Testament is God with us. New Testament is God in us. John 14, 17, last scripture, talking about the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, 
but you know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. If we, if we see him only, it will be in fear. But we can know him in faith. To see him is one thing, but to know him is a totally different thing. To know about him is another step. I can see him through the eyes of the writers of the word. I can know him by knowing his word, or I can know him by being filled with him. That's what he really wants. He wants us to have him in us. Are you going to see him in fear or really know him in faith? Jesus, while I preach today, I could feel you focusing on certain people in this room. There's fear in their lives right now. They've been rowing a long time. They're tired. They're afraid. And you begin to approach and first of all, they're afraid. But oh Lord, your voice today says, I am. Be not afraid. What were your words, Jesus? Run? No. Peter said, if it's you, I want to get out of this boat that I'm rowing and come closer to you, not farther away. I don't want to run away from you, Jesus. I want to run to you. Even if it's on water, something that appears to be impossible. Your situation may appear impossible right now, and you say, I can't even get to him. Please listen to me. If you have an intention on getting closer to Jesus, he'll let you walk on water today to get to him because it's his desire for you to know him. He doesn't want you to be afraid of him. He wants you to know him in peace and know him in faith. He's inviting. He's inviting everyone to come to this altar right now. He's saying, I want to know you in power and faith. I don't want you to see me in fear you come up to this altar and just say, Lord, I, I don't know what's happening. I feel your power. I feel an overwhelming presence coming over my life right now, and I invite you to come close to me, Jesus. I don't want to be afraid of you. Jesus, I don't understand what's going on, but help me to understand. Help me to experience Jesus wants to fill someone with his spirit today. He wants to pay the ultimate price. That's what he did on Calvary, but he did it not just to be a story in the Gospels. He did it so that you could be closer to him and he could be closer to you. Jesus, let me allow you to fulfill your will today by approaching me. I give you permission, Jesus, to approach me, and I'm sorry for every sin that I committed. I ask you to forgive me. Forgive me, Jesus. Let's worship. Let's worship, Jesus. <sighs> Replace fear with faith. Come on, some of you are afraid right now. Let him replace it with faith. Fear of him was replaced with the ability to walk on water.
Let him come closer. I give you my soul. Let him minister to you today. Jesus. I don't want to be afraid of inviting you closer. For whatever reason, Lord, take my fear away. Take my fear away and help me to invite you into my boat.